Good morning, Christ Church. Welcome to worship this morning. Whether you're joining us here in person or online, we thank you so much for joining us for worship today. As we prepare to worship God this morning, we want to um, uh, make you aware of some of the things that are happening here at Christ Church in the coming days. First of all, just as a reminder, we do recommend uh, that you wear a mask while you are here in worship with us. Uh, if you are not able to do that, we do understand, uh, and, and we are not going to require them, but if you are at all able to wear a mask, we do uh, recommend that you wear one as we continue to uh, to deal with COVID as the uh, uh, vaccination is now being rolled out. We uh, want to continue to to operate by the recommendations of the CDC. Uh, our youth group is back and meeting again uh, on Wednesday night, 6 to 7.30. We hope that you will join us. We had a great time this uh, past week 
and um, uh, hope that you'll, you'll continue to join us. Coming up, not this coming Wednesday, but the following Wednesday. So that, let's see, today is the thir- uh, 17th, 18, 19, 20. So that'll be about the 27th. Um, uh, we will be doing a Nerf war that night and uh, with uh, Nerf guns. Uh, so uh, the church may be filled with um, uh, uh, orange-tipped blue darts for a few months after that. We may be finding them in odd places, but we will be doing that, so hope that you guys can join us for that. We also uh, continue to have the, the church uh, auto decal window stickers available for your vehicle. You can pick one up. Uh, we just asked for a $2 donation to help us cover the cost of printing those, but I uh, hope that you'll... Um, Uh, Pick one of those up and uh, slap one on your car as I have my truck. Uh, I just wanted to also make you aware of the feed TC numbers uh, for December. In the month of December, we were able to feed 653 uh, people through the food pantry. We had 118 additional at our community meals. And through the Benevolence Fund, uh, we're able to give out eight gas cards and a phone card. So uh, thank you uh, for your faithful giving that is enabling us to reach out into our community with the love and the grace of Jesus Christ, and we will continue to do that. Uh, And to all of our volunteers, thank you so much. Uh, Whether you're with us for a community meal or the food pantry and food rescue tables, uh, whatever it is, uh, we thank you so much uh, for helping us in that way. If you would like to volunteer with the food pantry or the community meal, you can contact the church office and we'll get in touch with you. As we prepare to worship God, will you stand if you are able? If you are not, it is fine to remain seated. Uh, but, uh, and join me in our call to worship. It's found this morning in Psalm 115, verses 12 and 13. Let's proclaim God's goodness together this morning. The Lord has remembered us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both the great, small and the great. Let's worship God this morning.
it's all about you all about you jesus i'm sorry lord for the thing i've made it when it's all about you all about you jesus
Let's now give thanks for the tithes and offerings that came in this week. Father in heaven, we thank you for the gifts that have come forward that have been mailed into the church this past week, as well as those that have been dropped in the boxes here in the sanctuary at our entrance and exit this morning. Father, we thank you for the faithfulness of your people and the blessings that you, you pour out into our lives, because this morning we return a portion of that to you, proclaiming our faith and our trust ultimately in you above all else. And Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for the opportunity that, that these gifts represent to, to share your love and your grace in our community. We thank you uh, not just for the, the, the financial gifts that are given, but the gifts of time and talent from the many volunteers who, who uh, uh, work so hard uh, here in the food pantry and at Community Meal and in our youth ministry and our children's ministry, just all over the place, Lord. Those in the media team, the worship team, in the office. Lord, we thank you so much for the many hands uh, that are offered to make uh, uh, this ministry a reality. And Lord, we pray for those uh, who are, are struggling. We think particularly of, of Ed Halverson, who is, is traveling to uh, be a part of the funeral for his mother. And we pray that you would be with uh, Ed and Melody and their family as they mourn the loss of Ed's mom. We, we pray for uh, Greg and Ruth as they continue to rest and recover at home. Uh, from illness, we pray that you would be with them. We pray for all in our community who are struggling with loneliness, with the financial pressure, uh, all that have been brought on by uh, this uh, COVID-19 illness. We pray that you would be with them. Lord, we pray that you would help us as a community to wrap ourselves around them and support them in any way that we can. Uh, Lord, we pray your blessings on them. We pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, who taught us to pray using these words as we offer to you the Lord's prayer this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You can be seated. You know, you can, um, you can learn a lot about life by uh, closely observing the natural world. And in fact, the great British theologian and pastor John Stott was a, an avid bird watcher. He, he traveled around the world, uh, not just as a speaker and as a theologian, as a teacher, but, uh, but just to catch a glimpse of birds he hadn't seen yet. In fact, he, he wrote a book uh, that I've read. It's a great book called The Birds Are Teachers. And he talks about the different uh, lessons about God and about life uh, that the birds have to teach us. He talks talks all about the different things their habits can teach us about life and faith. You know, I love to attract and and feed birds and and, and watch birds that are our feeders. Um, you know, scripture itself often points us to the natural world for examples of, of how to act or how not to act. And one of the most famous examples, of course, is found in the Old Testament book of Proverbs. Where it says, go to the ant. O sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief officer or ruler, she prepares uh, her bread in summer and gathers her food in the harvest. So, you know, we have, we can, how many of you have ever observed ants, right? I mean, you know, most of us don't pay much attention to ants unless they're getting, messing, uh, you know, with our camp out or our picnic in some way. But, but scripture points us to the ants, uh, just teeny tiny little ants for examples of, 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 of how to live. So we can learn a lot by carefully observing what's happening around us on a walk or, or on a hike or while out camping, even in our yards. You know, there's probably something we can even learn from the mice in our basement if we're willing to pay attention to them. 
Well, research published in, back in January of 2006 showed that worker ants are willing to sacrifice both time and efficiency in, in order to teach other ants how to find food. It's a practice that's beneficial not for that individual worker ant, but for their society as a whole. You see, there's a species of ant in Europe called the rock ant. And when a, when a female rock ant goes out to find food, she'll often choose another ant to accompany her. If the second ant doesn't know the way to the food source, uh, the leader will teach her through a process they call, well, the ants don't call it this, the scientists do, tandem running. We don't know what the ants call it, I don't speak ant. As the teacher uh, runs along the path to the food, the student follows behind, but the student will often stop to locate landmarks, and when that happens, the leader ant will stop, so that uh, you know, it kind of creates a gap between the, um, uh, herself and the leader. So the leader ant stops and, and waits, and when the student is ready, she'll run forward and tap her teacher on the back of the legs, and the teacher will continue forward. Now this process is incredibly inefficient for the leader, who would, it would be much, much faster for her to just go back and forth to the food uh, all the time but it's much more beneficial to the, the, the colony for more than one ant or more, you know, however many ants are going out, for each one to have a student that they're taking with them, teaching them where the food source is. It's extremely beneficial for the students. So ants participating in, in, in tandem uh, uh, running locate a food source in an average of 201 seconds if they've been taught. While ants searching for food on their own, it took them an average of 310 seconds. It was a 35% time difference. The process is detrimental to the teachers. They, they, the, they travel, the lead ants travel four times faster when they're not accompanied by a student, but the overall community is benefited when they work together. So why do the, the leaders sacrifice their time and efficiency to teach others? Well, according to the, the study leader, a man apparently who likes ants named Nigel Franks, he said they're very closely related nest mates and their society as a whole is gonna benefit from this because the students gradually learn their way and they're able to teach then other ants, which increases the efficiency of the entire population. Now, researchers also found out that there were some teacher ants who tried to take a shortcut, right? They tried to put, uh, you know, because we know that it, really ants are incredibly strong little buggers. They can carry things much bigger than they are, uh, something that, you know, no other species can do. And, and uh, these teacher ants would simply pick up and carry the follower on their back and drop them off at the food source trying to save time. Right? There, this technique was three times faster than tandem running, but the carry dance weren't able to remember on their own how to get back and forth to the food source, probably because they were upside down and backwards. So it was more efficient for the individual to get more done by herself, but the overall process was hindered because the younger ant she had carried to the food source couldn't make her way back and forth on her own. So the ants that took the time to help others got less done themselves, but the whole nest benefited because as a whole, they got much more done. Well, as we continue our journey through Paul's letter to the Romans, we come today to, to Romans chapter three or 12, verses three through eight. Now in this passage, Paul begins to give examples of the renewed mind and the consecrated bodies offered as living sacrifices to God that he describes in, in, in Romans 12, 1 and 2, the passage, very popular passage in scripture, very famous passage in scripture that we looked at last week where Paul says, um, you know, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And then Paul begins to offer examples of what that renewed mind and consecrated life uh, offered as a living sacrifice to God looks like. And what he's saying is this is what it looks like when your mind is renewed by Christ. This is how you start to think. In fact, in this passage, he's gonna tell us how we need to start thinking about ourselves. 
Let's look together at Romans 12, verses three through eight. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Part of the renewal of our minds in Christ that leads to our transformation, our growth toward Christ's likeness as we follow Jesus, is that we begin to think differently about ourselves. In verse 2, which we looked at last week, Paul says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And then in verse 3, he says, everyone among you should not think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but should think about herself, about himself, with sober judgment. Now, the word Paul chose to use for thinking here is a word that points more to the direction of your thinking than just the act of thinking. So he's not talking here about how often you think about yourself or the things that you need to get done that day or how, how your life is going. He's talking about the content of your thinking. He's talking about your overall view of yourself. As our minds are renewed, we begin to think differently about ourselves. Now remember, this transformation, this renewal is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. Right? In fact, it will be happening every second of every minute, of every hour, of every day that you are alive as a follower of Christ. It will happen until the second that you die. Even the most mature follower of Christ is still being transformed. I mean, look at sweet Lois back here. Now, I, I've lost count, Lois. Is it 92? 92 years young. And I can promise you that, that as hard as it is for us to believe it, that St. Lois back here is still being transformed, she's still being transformed by the Holy Spirit. Isn't that right, Lois? She says, absolutely it is, right? It, it's a process. And it's going to happen throughout your entire life in Christ. But it's always move, it's moving forward. We're not supposed to be stagnant. So as the process move, moves forward, as we study and meditate on God's word, as we gather together for worship and to encourage one another, as we serve God in the world, in other words, as we follow Christ, we begin to take on a different view of ourselves. You see, sin replaces God with self, right? It places the self at the center of everything. Now that doesn't mean that we're all necessarily selfish. There's a difference between being selfish, kind of stingy with something, and self-centered, right? Self-centered is our orientation, even sometimes to why we help and why we serve. We, we serve because it makes us feel good. We help others, we're generous because it makes us feel good. And that's a natural byproduct of that. But you see how the self keeps kind of trying to creep to the center, even of the most uh, selfless acts, right? That's our default state. I don't need God. I don't want God. I can, I can be good enough on my own. We even see that in the church sometimes. I can do enough good on my own. And, and most of us can do a lot of good on our own. But we can't be perfect, and that's the standard. Now that makes me ask the question, I don't know about you, have you ever wondered, why is perfection the standard? Why did God make perfection the standard? Well, perfection is the standard not because God decreed it, but because God himself is perfect. 
is holy, is righteous, perfect holiness and righteousness in his nature and his character. Sin can't exist in God's presence, not because God decreed it in some way, but because God's holiness and God's righteousness will consume it. Sin simply can't exist in God's presence. God will by his very nature, by his just existing, consume it. So what God does in Christ is he applies Christ's righteousness to us even though we as human beings still make mistakes and we still sin and we still fall short. And it all goes back to our inherited natural con condition of, of sin, of replacing God with self. But as our, you know, so he gives us, he applies Christ's righteousness to us. He clothes us in Christ's righteousness. And Christ gets clothed, was clothed on the cross with our sin. That's grace. So as our minds are renewed, we begin to see ourselves differently with sober judgment, Paul says. And we begin to view ourselves accurately with humility. Now humility is not an attitude that says I'm nothing, I'm a worm. That certainly isn't what God says about you and how God views you. God sent Jesus, the Son, to die a brutal death on a Roman cross for you and for me. What does that say about you? It says that you're a treasure. It doesn't say that you have no value, that you don't matter, that you're a worm. The life and death of Jesus are heaven shouting, you matter, you are loved, your life has meaning. That I'm nothing, I'm, I'm just a worm attitude isn't actually humility at all. It's actually false humility, which is a form of pride. It's still focused on me. It just has a negative view of me. All right, that's not humility. It's still focused on self, just negatively instead of positively. Now, of course, the, the opposite of that is also a problem. Pride as we usually think of pride. It's all about me. And we've kind of gone off the deep end in that direction in the church in America in recent years. I mean, it's become all about celebrity pastors and rock star worship leaders. This uniquely American disease, and every culture has their own distortions of reality, the American disease of radical individualism has kind of taken us in that direction. But the truth is the church has always struggled with this in some way because it, it hits close to the heart of sin. It's really all about me. The early church had its superstars too. One was Paul, right? Another was Peter. Another was a man named Apollos. And in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul is speaking to divisions in the Corinthian church that are, that are created by that superstar attitude when he says, it's been reported to me, to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? <laughs> or were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. So they had this, you know, I, I, I prefer Cephas, I prefer Paul, I prefer Apollos. Later on, Paul says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, and God gave the increase. It's not about any one of us. It's not about some superstar Christian leader. It's about Jesus Christ. So as our minds are renewed, we begin to view ourselves accurately, neither too highly nor too low. We know that we are deeply loved by God and we're recipients of his grace and so are the others following Jesus on this journey with us. Back in 1994, which interestingly enough was uh, the last time the Buffalo Bills, who won the AFC, uh, made it to the AFC championship game last night, uh, the last time they were actually in the Super Bowl, 94, Thurman Thomas was a great, great running back. And he, he, with his head bowed and his hands covering his face, he sat on the Buffalo bench following the team's fourth straight Super Bowl loss. 
His three fumbles that day had helped seal the fate of the Buffalo Bills. Four consecutive Super Bowls, four consecutive Super Bowl losses. And suddenly, standing before him was the Dallas Cowboys star running back, Emmitt Smith. He'd just been named the Super Bowl MVP for Super Bowl uh, 28. And he was carrying his small goddaughter. And he's standing in front of Thurman Thomas. He walked across the field. Thomas has got his hands in his face on, on the Buffalo bench, kind of feeling really bad about how his performance had impacted his team that day in a bad way. And Emmett Smith, who just won the Super Bowl MVP, looked down at his goddaughter and he said, Honey, I want you to meet the greatest running back in the NFL, Mr. Thurman Thomas. Now, Thurman Thomas was one of the greatest running backs at the time, but he'd had a bad day. Emmett Smith was a great, great running back, too, and he'd played a really good game. But Emmett Smith wanted to make sure his goddaughter got the chance to meet this great running back, Thurman Thomas, his opponent, and the man he considered to be the greatest running back in the NFL. In spite of his own accomplishments on the, on the field, it wasn't about him. And honey, I want you to meet the greatest running back in the NFL. For by the grace given to me, Paul says, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Now look at verses four through eight. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. You aren't supposed to do what I do. I'm not supposed to do what you do, right? So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So Paul lists a few spiritual gifts here, prophecy and service and teaching and exhortation and giving and leadership and mercy. Now, this isn't a complete list. I don't think there is a complete list of all the spiritual gifts God gives to his people. None of the lists of spiritual gifts in the Bible claim to be comprehensive, and there's no evidence that they are. Paul's point is, as you take on an accurate view of yourself, deeply loved by God, but also no more important than the person sitting next to you, you're set free to serve God with the gifts God has given you. You're free, you're set free to be uniquely you and make your contribution in the body of Christ. You see, you are a unique combination of personality and gifts and body type and life experiences and passions and abilities and all of those things together make you, you. Uniquely you. You are a special, unique, different than everyone else creation of God. In Psalm 139, David exclaims, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Are these the words of someone who sees himself as a worm? As a nobody, as a nothing? No. They're the words of someone who knows that he is a unique part of God's creation. He knows who he is as a unique creation of God. This is the view God wants you to take of yourself, that you are formed and knitted together by God. Yes, your life is marked and marred by sin. God wants us to take that view of ourselves too. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us, right? But we are deeply loved and cared about by God. So much so that Jesus endured death on a Roman cross for you. You are formed and knitted together by God. Have you ever watched someone knit something? 
there's an intimacy and a careful attention to it, isn't there? It's not something that's done carelessly or sloppy. You are fearfully and wonderfully made, a wonderful work of God. Paul himself echoes these words in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, where he says, For we are his workmanship, God's craftsmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, redeemed in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You are God's workmanship. God's craftsmanship, uniquely and carefully crafted by God. And you have something to offer the body of Christ. Marilyn is God's workmanship. Linda is God's workmanship. Susan Ryan is God's workmanship, isn't he? She says, oh, yes, he is. Randy is God's workmanship. Watching on TV this morning, Bob is God's workmanship. Eddie is God's workmanship. Claude is God's workmanship. And each one has something unique to offer that only you can offer. You are not a worm. But you also aren't a unicorn. You are uniquely you, but you are a part of a team. A team so united that scripture refers to it as a body. And no one part is more important than the others. You see, Christ is the head. The one irreplaceable part. In Colossians 1.18, Paul says, and he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. I am not the head. Linda is not the head, although most of us think so, because she's the head of this physical place. And I do what she tells me to do. But Christ is the head. The life of the body and the mission, the intention of the body flow from the head. And we together are the body of Christ. He is the head. He alone is the head. It isn't Jesus and this celebrity pastor. It isn't Jesus and this rock star worship leader. It's simply Jesus. That's why we call ourselves Christ Church. And we together are parts of that body. Now, some parts seem more important than others because we live in a broken world. And, and, and we as human beings celebrate some gifts more than others, right? We celebrate great speakers and great singers and dynamic personalities and those with great strength and physical prowess and sometimes just plain old culturally conditioned good looks. But those are things we place value on. God understands that every part's critically important. We don't think much about a fingernail until we lose one. And you realize how much it hurts under there with that one. You don't think very much about one of, one of your individual toes until you stub it and your whole body writhes in pain. Right? We don't think much about our pancreas until the doctor tells us we have pancreatic cancer and it's pretty much a death sentence. Now there's something I want you to notice about the list of gifts Paul places here because of that. The first one's prophecy. Now let's be honest, when we think about the gift of prophecy, which isn't always or even usually foretelling the future. It's what we call forth-telling, helping the body of Christ to see what God is doing in confusing times. That's a major part of it. Think about the Old Testament prophets. There were prophets throughout the Old Testament, but when were they the most active and when were their works the most recorded? 
in the times leading up to during and, and during the fall of Jerusalem and their exile in Assyria and Babylon. And then during the time of rebuilding, which didn't exactly go very smoothly. When we think of the gift of prophecy, we, you know, so, so what, what was happening there when Isaiah and Ezekiel and, and Jeremiah and Amos and Joel and all these folks are prophesying, it's during an incredibly confusing and difficult time for the people of Israel. And they needed to understand what God was doing and how what God was doing now was going to have an impact in the future in Jesus Christ, as Isaiah reminds us. Now, when we think of the gift of prophecy, we usually think of someone who is either super spiritual, like a really faithful seasoned follower of Christ, or someone who's kind of deluded and arrogant and thinks they're a prophet and probably isn't, right? Some of those YouTube prophets we see today. We place a high value on that gift when someone's a prophet, when someone has the gift of prophecy. But what's the gift that Paul mentions next? Right beside it. What is it? Serving. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving. Behind the scenes, unseen, uncelebrated, unnoticed, Paul places them side by side. We might value certain gifts and personalities more than others, but God doesn't. And every part of the body is necessary for the body to be what it's supposed to be and do what it's supposed to do. Now look at verse eight, the last part. The one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. We are to throw our whole selves into it with zeal and cheerfulness and do it well. If your gift is giving, Paul says, do it generously. Do it well. Not grudgingly, but joyfully as living sacrifices. When you come here and serve in the food pantry or out at the, out at the uh, food rescue tables, when you come here on a Saturday night, when you'd rather be at home watching a football game or a hockey game, and you're here serving a meal instead, you are offering yourself a living sacrifice. When you're up early on a Sunday morning and you're here preparing for worship and turning on the lights, when you're here on a Tuesday afternoon when nobody knows you're here and you're fixing a, you know, our ancient uh, boiler or something, you know, um, you are offering yourself as a living sacrifice. Paul says, do it joyfully and do it well. Now, I will have lived and ministered up here in northern Michigan for 25 years this coming August. I moved up here out of college in 96, and I met Becky, and, and, and it was all over. Um, I wasn't going anywhere unless she was, and her roots here run deep you know, like really deep, back to the first settlers deep, right? Um, I've been up, so I've been up here for a long time. I mean, in fact, Becky said, if, if we're getting married, you need to know somebody. My roots here run deep. I'm not going anywhere. I said, okay. But it, 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 you know that I'm a, a sports fan, right? You know, I, I like my sports. I've often been known to wear a jersey to the office during the week or whatever. Most of my outfit is, my, my wardrobe is Ohio State themed, isn't it, Linda? Yep, yep, she knows, she knows. Go Bucks. So a lot of my sports allegiances have stayed in Ohio with the exception of the Tigers and the Red Wings. So I root for the Cincinnati Bengals. Now I know, you've probably never seen a Bengals fan before. We're rare, but we do exist. So, so this year, our quarterback was this hot young recruit out of, out of our uh, draft, uh, draftee out of LSU, a young man from Ohio named Joe Burrow. He's a great quarterback. He has the potential to be truly great. Won the Heisman Trophy and a national trans, uh, championship last year at LSU. Great, great quarterback. And, and although the team wasn't winning early in the season, we also weren't getting blown out, which is something we Bengals fans have become accustomed to. 
you know, we were in most of the games. Most of our games were decided by less than a touchdown. Yes, we kept losing them, uh, but we were in it. And, and things were coming together. They were starting to come together as Burrow got used to the speed and intensity of football in the NS NFL. And then he got hurt. And it ended his season. Now, why did he get hurt? Because our offensive line is terrible. All right? They couldn't protect him. Until he got hurt, he was the most hit quarterback in the NFL. I mean, every time they snapped the ball to him, you were kind of like, you know, are they going to kill him this time? If they didn't, he made great passes. But great quarterbacks can't throw the ball when they're lying flat on their backs wondering what time zone they're in. You know, a great quarter, for a great quarterback to be great, he needs a great offensive line. Now, no one knows who those guys are. No one knows who the center for the Cincinnati Bengals is or the right guard. Nobody really even cares. Those are the guys making like the league minimum. They're not making the millions. They're still making more money than I do, but they're making the, the league, league million. Joe Burrow is making millions a year. The, big ugly guy that keeps him standing, or should be keeping him standing up, right, makes like $200,000 a year. It's more realistic. No one knows who those guys are. The only time their names are even called they, is when they commit a penalty. You know, they don't like having their number called during games. But their job is just as important as that of the highly paid quarterbacks and receivers, isn't it? Because when they're not doing their job, the quarterback is lying flat on his back and has no idea where he is with a concussion. Or in Joe Burrow's case, with a blown out knee. We're a team. A body made up of individuals who are fearfully and wonderfully crafted together by, by God, brought together by our common sinfulness and our common need of Christ and our common salvation in Christ. So we don't view ourselves more highly than we ought, but we also don't view ourselves more lowly than we ought. We simply understand, you know what? God kind of digs me, and I don't really understand it. I don't know why, but God digs you too. You know, John comes in every, uh, John and Marilyn are among our volunteers on Fridays, and uh, along with Marilyn and several others, uh, for the food pantry. And John, because he's, you know, um, a young man, um, he ca helps carry a lot of the boxes. So he helps unload the food rescue truck, and then he helps the people who have gone through the food rescue tables in the food pantry, he helps them carry their stuff out to the car. He tells every single person he helps, you're a treasure. You're a treasure. That's our attitude. By the grace given to me, Paul says, I say to everyone among you, not to view himself more highly than he ought to think, that's our human tendency, but to think of himself with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Because you are gifted. You are a treasure. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for the treasures that surround us this morning. I pray that you would help us to see ourselves with your eyes as deeply loved treasures surrounded by other deeply loved treasures. So we, may we not view ourselves more highly than we ought, May we not view ourselves more lowly than we ought, but understand that we are deeply loved by you most of the time in spite of ourselves. We thank you for this. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. If you're able, will you stand and join us as we worship the Lord? What? 
Thanks so much for joining us for worship today. As you go, may God bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you his peace. Go in peace. You're a treasure. <laughs>